I'm Lisa Bilyeu and I went from housewife to co-founder the billion dollar company Quest Nutrition and now president of Impact Theory. Our mission with this show is to empower you and all women to recognize you really can become the hero of your own life. Welcome to Women of Impact. Endlessly bullied by friends and teachers for being too sensitive, today's Women of Impact never felt like she belonged. And at the age of 16, when she visited her family in Canada for the summer, she witnessed her home back in Lebanon get engulfed in war. She was now left with an impossible decision. Go back to a dangerous place that never felt like home to begin with, a place she never felt like she belonged in the first place, or stay in a foreign country that spoke a foreign language, a place that was far from welcoming, a place where she definitely didn't feel like she belonged. Now making the painful decision to stay in Canada, she found herself lost, angry and alone and shutting out her emotions not to feel the pain was now her full-time job and she was clocking overtime. Writing poetry, which was once her saviour, was now her enemy. Why? Well, because writing meant she actually had to acknowledge her feelings. So she ripped up her journals and for seven straight years she blocked it out. And it wasn't until she found herself teaching young refugees with relatable struggles where she reminded again of the power of the almighty pen. Now, author, speaker and educator, this beautiful specimen of a poet is giving a voice to anyone who feels silenced. Speaking out as part of the Me Too and Time's Up movement, she addressed a crowd of over 700 people on International Women's Day, where she bravely spoke out about her own experiences and just urged business leaders to re-examine harassment investigations, particularly with low-ranking employees. So please help me in welcoming the woman whose work has been featured in the New York Times, Huffington Post and Glamour to name a few. The author of Mind Platter, The Nectar Pain and Sparks of Phoenix, which is a collection of poetry that is like a telescope into her soul. The woman who is the shout to the echo, the beautifully poetic Nadra Zabayan. You're so sweet. <laughs> Welcome to the show, my dear. Um, your story is incredible. And where I want to start is the fact that you didn't feel like you belonged anywhere. Mm -hmm. A lot of people fight that, not knowing where they belong. Talk me through how you felt and then how you got out of that. Mm -hmm. I think we tend to believe that home is a house, a physical place where you can stay. When really home is the place where your soul feels like it belongs, where you feel like you can be unapologetically yourself and you are being loved for who you are. A place where you don't have to work hard just to be loved. Mm -hmm. And uh, because my parents were traveling between Lebanon and Canada from, the age of, from my age of eight to 16, I had to live with multiple relatives. And it's, it, it never, to me, it's never like, oh, they treated me badly. Mm -hmm. It's not like that at all. It's just my own internal feelings of displacement and mm -hmm. not knowing where home really is mm -hmm. and not knowing whether me being the way that I am, which is a very sensitive girl, very sensitive human, I don't know if I should show that to those around me because it, I don't know if they want to listen to my voice. I don't know if they see what I need to be seen about me. And so, you know, being bullied at school during that time by both, as you mentioned, students and teachers made it even more difficult for me to feel like my voice was worthy of being heard. Mm -hmm. And so I stayed quiet for so long. And I love Lebanon. It's my home country. I really do love it, but it never felt like home. So then when I, when I moved to Canada, I remember the first day a teacher saw me, and I used to cover my hat at the time, my hair, and uh, she, she said to me, oh, I know who you'll mix well with. So she took me to a group of girls who also wore the hijab at the time. And I remember standing amongst them thinking, I don't belong here. Really? Yeah, because I, it was such a cultural shock for me that even they looked like me, but they were, most of them, born and raised in Canada. I come from a village of a thousand people, you know, we, we, everybody there was Muslim, everybody there was, you know, following the same kind of lifestyle, mm. and here I was in a 
brand new country where there are different rules and there are different ways that even people who resemble me uh, live differently. Um, within those. It never even dawned on me <laughs> that that would be the case. Like, yeah. That's such a powerful message of like, we all make assumptions. We do. Yeah. Yes. So did you tell people like, yeah, this doesn't feel no, like my group? Because or? I just, I was very quiet. I remember not going to the cafeteria of my school, of my high school mm. until the second semester of that year. And I only went once because a friend of mine needed to get something for lunch. I never mixed with people. I stayed in the library at lunch, mm -hmm. did my homework for the next day, and that was it. I just never mixed with people. Never. It was such a lonely time. Was it that, like, so obviously, looking back now, were you doing it as, like, a safety because, like, you could trust your, you being by yourself? Because if you look at these people um, that you could you didn't even make the effort, right? You said you didn't go to the cafeteria. Was it that for you, safety was standing back and keeping to yourself? Yes. It was safety and also fear. Okay. It was fear that I would be judged for mm. who I was. And, I, and I, I think part of me didn't even want approval. Part of me had given up on mm. being part of something that I just wanted to go to class and go home, and that was it. When I reflect back on those years, I see them in black and white yeah. because they were very, very much, there was, no, there, was, there was no feeling of joy or feeling of um, being present. It was just getting by, you know? Mm -hmm. That's, that was my life. It was just getting by, and hopefully one day happiness will come because that's what everybody tells you, is that it comes at some point. Go to school, get a job, get married, and then happiness will come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got an amazing quote. I've actually got a ton of quotes <laughs> yeah. from you. But um, I want to talk about pain. You wrote something about it that just hit me hard. You said, when pain knocks on your door, mm. let it in. Yeah. If you don't, it will knock harder and harder. Its voice will become louder and louder. So let it in. Spend time with it. Understand it then walk it to the door and let it leave because it's time for you to welcome happiness. Yeah. <laughs> um, were you able to do that? Is that what you did? And then if so, how do you do that? I struggled with, I struggled for a very long time. You can see I'm getting emotional just hearing that because I remember when I wrote it. I struggled for a long time with accepting that what I went through was painful. Because instead of accepting that I went through a painful experience, I accepted that something was wrong with me and that I had to fix myself and that I had to fix the way I was thinking about things. So I was in denial of what happened to me, sort of like a defense mechanism against knowing what needs to be done to resolve mm. that pain. And so I, I resisted allowing myself to see it as something that wasn't my fault. And I kept it at the door. And, you know, it goes from being on your mind for an hour a day to being on your mind two hours a day to being on your mind all the time. When you fall asleep, when you wake up, you're constantly tunnel visioned on that pain. And it feels like physical pain. That's how bad it becomes. So if you don't allow it, it's going to keep knocking. It'll keep knocking. And if you don't just say, you know what? Life has thrown pain at me. I can't keep ignoring it. I have to allow it in. I have to understand why it hurts so much. And that's difficult. No one wants to feel pain. No one wants to be in pain. Mm -hmm. But this is the nature of life. So I treat it as a visitor. I say, you're welcome in, but you're not welcome to stay. You're welcome to have a tea with me. We'll talk about this and then you leave. And then I have another visitor, which is happiness. So that's why I wrote that poem, because I really believe that if pain is knocking on your door and you deal with the pain and take it out of the way, you're allowing room for yourself to see and feel that happiness that's waiting at your door. God, I love yeah. that. Okay, so take me 
into how you actually then do that. Mm -hmm. So taking your in pain, you're closing the door, you're trying to ignore it, you're trying to ignore it. When did you finally open the door? What did that actually look like? So what are the steps you have to take? And then how do you close that door again? I think step number one is recognizing and naming what you went through. Okay. Yes. So how did you name it? For me, it was abuse. It was gaslighting. It was manipulation. Um, it was uh, dealing with narcissism and playing on my emotions. Mm -hmm. And I think we hear the word abuse, but we don't really understand it unless we, or understand that we are going through it unless we see what it looks like for others. Because a lot of times we mistaken love for abuse. We say that somebody treating us a certain way is a, a loving way, or it's, it's a way for them to discipline us in some way, when really it's abuse, but we don't have the word to put it onto what's going on with us. And so when I started researching things that I was going through, things that I was being told, I came across words like gaslighting, and I'm like, gaslighting? What does Which, what does, mean? Yeah, what does it mean? Because I heard you say it, but I didn't hear the explanation. Yeah, so gaslighting is when somebody distorts your own understanding of your own reality, when they try to change your story. So for example, imagine that somebody that you trust very much, this could be your partner, mm -hmm. um, tells you, you remind them of a certain thing they said to you, and they say, I didn't say that. And because you trust them, you trust that they're telling the truth. So they make you question your own reality. Mm. So this didn't happen because it actually happened. This happened because you manufactured it in your brain. Mm -hmm. And so they play mind games on you. And um, when I think of gaslighting, I think I would go through moments where I would feel like I'm completely here. I understand what's going on. And then two seconds later, I'm questioning, is it really what happened or is it what my brain is telling me happened? And so it's, it's, mm. it's incredibly destructive for a person and it's so hard to get out of. So step number one yeah. is naming it yeah. because once you name mm. it, you, you're like, okay, now I can categorize everything that I'm going through and say, this is where it falls under. This is what needs to be done moving forward. This is, this is what I need to stop allowing to happen. This is what I need to do about it in terms of raising your voice. Um, and this is what I will do moving forward in case this arises from the same person or from other people. That's the beginning point. Mm. Um, and then you get to seek help. So. I, I still see a therapist to this day, not as intensely as I saw her before, but she said, I remember when you first came here, you were just so, like there was darkness over you and you were so hopeless and didn't see that you had any power within you to stop what's happening or to overcome all these powerful people who are trying to bring you down and here you are and the power that you had was that you shared your story. And so that's where my healing began. And at that point, I had to talk about it and I had to understand how I got myself to a point where my whole self-worth and my whole image of who I was and understanding of who I was, was in someone's hands, mm -hmm. just one person's hands. And so there was a lot of unlearning that had to happen and there was a lot of reflecting on my earlier years that had to happen to understand what was it that um, the making of Nejwa, the making of me, of, of the me that was in a position to be so vulnerable and to be so taken advantage of. And I learned through time that to separate the fact that I had been looking for a home, I had been looking for love, and to say that just because someone took advantage of those needs and of those dreams, it doesn't mean that something was wrong with me for wanting them. We all want love, Ooh, right? Oh, no, you just gave me the chills there. <laughs> 
you have to draw that barrier because you blame yourself for wanting to be loved. You blame yourself for wanting to belong. You blame yourself for wanting to be relevant to someone when you shouldn't do that. That's the most beautiful, pure thing to want to feel loved. And then somebody looking at you and saying, oh, she's vulnerable. I'm going to take advantage of that. And you have to separate those two things and say, actually, your choice to take advantage of my need for love is all on you. It's not my weight to carry. It's not my burden to carry. Um, how do you then, when you're in that moment, so you've done all the unwinding, you've really worked on yourself, then approaching, uh, let's say, well, I still want love. I still want to yeah. be with somebody. I understand now that I can't let someone take advantage. Were there certain things that you put into play where you're like, okay, these are going to be triggers I'm going to look out for so that you know not to make that same mistake again? Because I think that's the fear people have, right? I gave it my all to this relationship and I got taken advantage of. They abused it. And now I'm so fearful of giving it over again. Have there been things that you've told yourself? It's like, okay, next time I'm going to do this. Yes, so in terms of having rules my rules don't have to do with people they okay. have to do with me Ooh. so they have to do with me drawing healthy boundaries mm -hmm. and not allowing myself to compromise my um my sense of self and my mm -hmm. sense of being of who i am just to allow somebody in or to allow myself to fit into someone's life. So the work has been on myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand that sometimes we do have to say, this is what I'm looking for in a person. But I think what comes before that is knowing yourself so that when it gets to a point where you are getting to know someone or you're, you are getting into a relationship, the moment you feel that you have to change things about yourself, then that gives you a red flag and you say, you know what, I am, I'm feeling like I have to change things about myself. And don't get me wrong, we all have things to change about ourselves. Right. And sometimes being in a relationship with someone pushes you to be a better version of yourself. But if it's pushing you to be a worse version than yourself, then that's mm -hmm. when you know this is not right for me. This is my need for love overriding my need for the right love for me Ooh. yeah okay so i think it, it begins with you working on what you accept what you don't accept um how you would want somebody who really loves you to treat you and and just knowing those things so that you're prepared so in education we say as a teacher i want to be proactive i want to uh, make sure that I set my students up for success and for not misbehaving before that misbehavior happens oh. so that I have to deal with it then. Instead of saying, I'm just going to be myself and then when bad behavior arises, I will punish them for it. And I think it's the same thing with relationships when you're proactive and you start with working on yourself and knowing who you are, instead of waiting to be in a relationship to figure those things out based on who that person is. And I know that sometimes people get into relationships at a younger age and they have to go through this experience mm. of, of turmoil and not knowing. And so I don't want anybody listening to think to themselves, oh, I did something the, the, the wrong way. Everybody falls into this you don't learn unless you fall down and and i learned by falling down many times and getting back up and so if you're at a point where you're wondering how do i move forward then this could be a great place to start i love that talk to me actually something you just said um, about like not beating ourselves up over things like mm -hmm. it's not wrong um, how do you not beat yourself up then um, are there things that you do or do you have a situation where you're like this taps into self-love and my definition of self-love. Mm -hmm. For me, self-love is picturing the person that you love the most and telling yourself, 
I will not treat myself any less than I would treat that person. If you were my most loved person on this earth, if you had a bad day and came to me, I would listen to you, I would understand you, I would make sure that you're feeling pampered, that you're feeling like you're safe here. So why can't I do that for myself when I'm having a bad day? Why can't I do that for myself when I make a mistake? Self-love is, is not treating myself any less than I would treat my loved ones and not allowing anybody to treat me less than I would treat my loved ones. When I make a mistake, and sometimes we make mistakes knowing that we're making them, yeah. I just remind myself that I am human. Yeah. The narrative that most of us go to when we go through any kind of failure mm -hmm. is something's wrong with me. I've known this all along, something's wrong with me, or I'm not destined for happiness, or I'm not destined for love and I just need to accept it. That's the, those are the narratives we usually go to. Mm -hmm. um, but the real narrative is much different from that. Everyone has their own path and everyone has their own destiny. Nobody knows that. You don't know that. So to give yourself a verdict mm -hmm. long before your life is over, Ooh. you know, is, is a very bad thing. Because if you've already believed about yourself that you are not destined for happiness or that something is wrong with you, then everything is going to confirm that for you. And you're only going to see the things that will confirm that for you, yeah. right? But if you say, if you, if you change that narrative and say, instead of saying, I'm not destined for happiness, to say, I took a shot at happiness and I learned something. Yeah, one of my favorite phrases is, if you believe you can, you can. If you believe you can't, you can't. Yeah. And I believe that too. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in fact, going to judging yourself, I think um, it's very typical, especially women, and I try not yeah. to generalize, but that we do blame ourselves for things. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got a great quote of yours <laughs> about blaming ourselves. Um, would you ask the sun why it shines brighter on some days than others? <laughs> would you ask the moon why it breaks the darkness on some nights and not others? Such is the course of life. Some days we give our best, but other days we just exist. Some yes. days we are kings and queens of our minds and mm -hmm. souls, and some days we are spaces to our hearts. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so I think on those dark days, on the days that the sun isn't shining, we blame ourselves, yes. right? Like it's our fault, we're doing this. But I love that when you say like, that analogy of like, if you just look at it in a, as a totality, yes, it's just the circle of life. Yes. So talk to me about that. It's so powerful. We are very hard on ourselves, especially during this time with social media being mm. so overwhelming for so many people. We think that every single day we need to have something amazing going on in our, in our lives or we have to be positive all the time. I can't tell you how many times people ask me, how do you stay positive all the time? And I'm just like, I'm not. <laughs> Good for you. You think that, that I am, that but I'm loud. not. Yeah. I'm not positive all yeah. the time. And so I feel that we are very hard on ourselves when we look at the lives of others and say, why haven't I achieved that? Or why haven't I achieved something similar to that? What more could I be doing? And so you're constantly focused on what needs to be done instead of what needs to prepare you for what needs to be done. And, and mm. right? So yeah. you, want, you want the recognition, you want the relevance, but you don't want to do the hard work that leads to that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wrote that just to say that, first of all, I always say, you are the sun. The very first entry in Mind Platter is titled, You Are the Sun. So I, I envision and visualize that, I am a sun and some days I'm very bright and other days I, I'm hiding and you can barely see me and, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with not constantly being that shining light on everyone and everything. There's nothing wrong with you taking time, first of all, to take care of yourself and second of all, to, to ask yourself, where am I and where do I want to go? Instead of just saying, I want to be, I want to be in the spotlight. Mm. You can't be always in the spotlight. And if you are, that's going to burn you out at some point. 
It's the same with happiness, I think, as well, right? me included, like I'm always looking like, oh, I want to be happy, I want to be happy. But understanding that you can't always be happy. No. And it's that precise notion mm -hmm. that allows you that when happiness does come for it to be so um, yeah. consuming and enjoyable. Yes. But I don't think we would have that if we always had happiness. If you have nothing to compare it to. Right. I am not of the mindset um, that it's okay to tell people just be grateful for what you have because look at all the people suffering and struggling. Okay. Because I feel that, that that gives people a sense of guilt for oh. wanting certain things huh. in their lives, um, yeah. certain things that very much could be needed, like love. And, like, and, and I know that you know, some people will say, well, that, that person doesn't have money to buy food and you're saying that you want to be loved. But love is such a fundamental thing to all of us, right? Dude, that's so hit me. You're so right. <laughs> so, so I don't like that attitude of saying just be grateful for what you have because, because of all these other bad things. It kind of puts you down in a way that makes you feel like you are asking for too much or you are being selfish by asking for something that you need. Right? It, it's, it's not dealing with the issue that you're going through. Yeah. It's telling you compare it to something that's worse. Instead of saying compare it to something that's worse, say go help that person. Right? Help them. This is the need that they have. Go help them with it if you can. But also help yourself mm -hmm. with what you need. Right? Yeah, the guilt thing really hit me when you said yeah. that because you're right. Is that, you know, I. I Absolutely, when I have you know bad digestion or my health isn't good, I'll try and say to myself, but look at other people. At least you don't have Crohn's disease, Lisa. At least you don't have this, right? I have Crohn's. You have, you have yeah. Crohn's? Oh, do you really? Yeah. Oh, God, let's talk about that. <laughs> um, so how do you work your, your mindset around that? Mm -hmm. So when I was first diagnosed, I was immediately put on very heavy medication and I would feel like there's fire in my head and in my hands and I couldn't sleep. And I constantly felt like I was disconnected from reality. And so when I started looking into it, um, I thought to myself, wow, look at what I'm putting in my body. And you have to deal with the side effects. So you go on antidepressants and you go on sleeping pills and you go. So it's like, dealing with a, with a chronic illness and also causing yourself so many other illnesses mm -hmm. and then taking more medications. And so it feels like your body isn't even yours anymore. And I felt like I'm not here anymore. I'm not present anymore. And I'm sick and tired of this. And I just stopped every single medication that I was on completely. And my doctor said, you're crazy. People usually take six months to wean themselves off of these medications and you're just doing it right away. And I said, I'm going to do well. I'm going to eat properly. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to stay away from stress or things that cause me stress and I'm going to do it. And I've been off medication for about three years now. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. What made you take ownership there? I just, like I said, I felt like my body wasn't mine anymore. I was, I was constantly drugging myself with all these different medications and then wondering why I'm not feeling. Like the antidepressants that you go on, their main goal is to not make you feel, right? So you become numb. And you, and, and you know me by now, I'm a poet. I feel, I'm sensitive. I have a lot of emotions going on inside of me. So it feels like there's this flood going on inside of you and you can't make sense of it because you're not even given, your body isn't even functioning the way you want it to, you know? Mm -hmm. It's being silenced in mm -hmm. some way, oh, okay. right? And so, and not, this mm -hmm. is not to tell people don't go on antidepressants. Sure. Go on them if you need to. Yeah, absolutely. But that's how I felt. I felt numb and I felt like... I wasn't dealing with what I was going through. It definitely seems like a massive theme in your life is um, being in situations where you have been silent. So you use that in, in regards mm -hmm. to Crohn's as well, which is incredible. Um, 
but you found you keep finding your voice, which yes. I think is amazing. Thank you. Um, and especially you standing up and talking on National Women's Day, and then how you were able to find that voice finally, because I'm sure there's a lot of people right now at home that is looking to find their voice. How do you do it? How do you get the guts and courage <laughs> to do it? And then stand up on such a public platform and be so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Going through the experience of being, um, of having power abuse exercised on me and feeling silenced by multiple power systems because this happened in my workplace and I, um, you know, I reported it and I spoke to many people who had power to do something about it and to, to raise my voice for me. And um, I could consistently and continuously felt like I was being told, you know, this is, nothing's going to happen out of this. You know, there was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of telling me indirectly, this is your fault. Um, you're sensitive. You're, you could have said no at certain points. You could have, but when there's power involved, I've always said this, saying no to a person in power when you're here and they're up here is not the same as saying no to a person who's at your level of power, right? Mm -hmm. Consent is not the same when there's power involved. It's not the same because there's a lot of fear from the person who's down here. You think to yourself, what is this person in power going to do if I say no or if mm -hmm. I reject them or if I push them away? That's why women specifically will stay silent about certain experiences because they know that it's going to be bad news for them down the line because those in power are going to say, oh, she's a troublemaker. She's, she's raised her voice about certain things before, so she might, you know. And that comes from a place of them. It's their own insecurities because if you, if you know that you're not going to make a mistake and you're not going to treat someone badly, then why would you not believe hmm. uh, someone who's saying that they've gone through a certain experience. Hmm. So I, I had been going through that for a while and internalizing, no one knew. My family didn't know. I was too ashamed to admit that I had gone through an experience like that or that I had feelings for someone. That's a very shameful thing to admit, um, especially in my culture. Hmm. And imagine sitting amongst your own family and hiding something like that, hiding an experience like that. It's like you're there and it would be easier for you to not be there because you're actively trying to cover up something, so much pain. It, it was a very much an internalized fear that I had and not wanting to disappoint them that stopped me from sharing anything. I, I wouldn't know how they would respond, but I assumed, I was in so much fear, I assumed that they would be so angry with me and disappointed and say, we don't want anything to do with you anymore. And same thing with my workplace and with my colleagues and with my friends, no one knew. So it got to a point where I felt not, that not only did I physically shrink, I felt that my soul shrunk and my self-esteem was zero. And I just, I was disappearing bit by bit. And I got to a point where the image that people saw was manufactured. It wasn't me at all. It wasn't me. The me that existed on the inside was someone who was aching to be heard, but thinking, but I've already shared this with people who could have done something about it and they didn't do anything about it. So I must stay silent. And seeing this person in power, continuing to gain power, made me feel even more and more and more powerless. And honestly, it got to a point where I, I wasn't suicidal, but I was imagining that I wasn't present. I was imagining the world without me. And so the turning point for me was, do I? continue to be this manufactured image that's being loved by and welcomed by people around me 
just for the sake of continuing to belong somewhere where I really don't belong? Or do I share the real me and risk losing everybody who loves me or who's welcomed me into their lives and actually be loved for who I am? And I wanted to be loved for who I am, as painful as it was. So I decided to put this person aside and let this person flourish. And so after I shared it, there were ripples starting to happen. And other women came forward and said, you know, he's done this to me years ago. And or he's done this to somebody that I knew. So I thought I was the only one. <laughs> I wonder if these women came forward to someone before and they were also told nothing's going to be done about this. So just be quiet. Just like I was quiet. And in a way, that silence was protecting him. Mm -hmm. And it was protecting all of the other stories from being from coming to light. And so when I discovered that there were others, I knew that something more had to be done with How this. How soon after this did people start It was start within the next out? few months. Okay. Yeah. Well, immediately I started getting messages from people. At this point it was like, I am the only one yeah. who's going to raise that voice. I'm not going to wait for someone to save me. I have to do this on my own. And for somebody who was quiet her whole life and who wanted people's approval or just didn't want to stir any trouble or disturb any waters, that was big for me to Why? do. I took months to make sure that my intention was not to hurt this person, mm. but it was to allow this hurt person to be relieved, to start the healing process. And healing couldn't begin if I was ashamed of my story. So when other women came forward on their own, um, all of a sudden, it all came back to me saying, she's the one who started it. So I, I received a legal threat uh, two or three days before International Women's Day. This is leading you up to the speech. Yeah. Saying that if you don't be quiet, we are pursuing legal action against you. So I received this letter on Monday and my speech was on Friday. So I read it and it was a, it was a, I had never served, been served legal papers before, but you know, I showed them to my lawyer. We talked about this and we decided we're going to like we're going to not do anything about this. So on Thursday, I get a call from a local media source and I'm like, "Why are they calling me?" Probably because it's International Women's Day and they want some kind of statement from mm -hmm. me. Then I get another call. Then my lawyer called and I was like, okay, this is bigger than what I think it is. So they had gone to the media saying, we served. They is in the person you had shared the story shared about. The story, yep. Him and his lawyers mm -hmm. went to the media saying, we have warned her not to talk about this anymore and to apologize for what she said. We will have people watching her during her speech tomorrow and taking notes so that if she does say something, we will proceed with our legal action. So imagine less than 24 hours before a keynote speech, I am the only speaker um, where there's going to be over 700 people. It, it was packed. It was oversold. Talking about International Women's Day, talking about women's rights at the time that the Me Too movement mm. and the, the Time's Up movement had exploded. T less than 24 hours, you're telling me, be quiet. I, and you know how stressful it is to prepare a speech. You just did a TEDx, <laughs> yes. right? I had to change everything. Here they are trying to silence me and my voice the day before my speech. So it had to become about, you cannot silence me. You cannot silence me. So I started my speech by saying, I heard that there are people taking notes. Just so you know, if there's a note you miss, just raise your hand and I'll repeat it for oh you. My God, that's <laughs> so that was basically me saying, you know, I, I'm telling people I am not going to be quiet because yeah. there was speculation in the media that night before saying 
you know, we're expecting that she was, she's going to address the legal threat, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so this was me saying, of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me not to talk about it. I am going to talk yeah. about it. And so being aware of all of that, I said, um, I understand that this experience that I went through isn't an experience that you can really relate to because you didn't go through it or your daughter didn't go through it or your son didn't go through it but if you think that i am someone's daughter and i have a father i am someone's sister i am someone's aunt i am someone's and i started saying all those things said if you were to look at me that way then you would see it differently and i was trying so hard to tell them to, 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 to help them empathize with the situation, to help them really understand that just because this didn't happen to you, you don't have, you're not off the hook. You need to understand that every victim of any form of abuse is someone to someone is worthy of being heard, is worthy of having their story out there, is worthy of us really looking at that story and looking at what led up to it. Mm. And so at closer to the end of the, of the speech, I held up the legal papers and I said, I will not apologize for telling my story. I will not apologize for sharing my truth. And you silenced me for long enough. And here you are showing every victim of any form of abuse out there, showing them that this is what will happen to them if they share their story. I'm the voice of that girl or that boy sitting in the corner, struggling with their story, afraid of what will happen if they share it. I am their voice. I don't amplify the voices of the abusers. I fight the voices of the abusers for those who experienced any form of abuse. So that's what happened at that that's speech. So <laughs> and is that what you were telling yourself the night before? Because taking everything you've said into context of who you used to be, the person that like ripped up her journal because she never wanted to feel, that stopped writing for so long, that was always the person that was a pleaser, that wanted to be liked, and you go, head first like you just jump in with both feet i'm gonna speak out like that's so hard and then you get served papers this is if you do it more we're gonna come after you like i couldn't imagine going from one perspective from one into another when you're in that moment and you've been served was there a moment of like should i actually do this no there was no doubt it means that I have something to say that scares them. Mm -hmm. So that I'm like going to fire say, then? oh, yeah. That's I was telling my friend <laughs> last week, I, my voice is strongest when I'm the most enraged about any kind of injustice. Mm. I have that personality of being very calm and kind and I don't get upset. But when I get upset, you have no idea what's going to happen. It's not in a hurtful way. It's in a truthful, mm. I will not accept this kind of way. So I knew that my most powerful um, asset was my truth at that point. And so there was nothing to hide. There was nothing to hide. They made me angry in all the right ways, in all the ways that would make all the right words come out on that day. And I felt very empowered afterwards. Absolutely incredible. Thank you. Um, I think I know the answer to this after <laughs> like just diving deep into your world, but what do you consider your superpower to be? <laughs> I would say my superpower is not being afraid to feel and to... Um, share the truth of who I am. That's what I would say is my superpower. Because to share the truth of who you are, you need to feel. You need to not be afraid to feel the feelings of um, pain, 
of rejection, of being silenced, of being let down. Because only when you feel those pains will you understand your truth. And once you do, then you can share your truth. Yeah. <laughs> and so where can people find all the amazing things that you're putting out? Where can they follow you? They can find them on my social media. Najwa Zabian um, is on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, wherever. And then, uh, as you mentioned, Mind Platter, The Nectar of Pain, and Sparks of Phoenix are my three books. So. And they can find that on your website? Yes, najwazabian.com. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, guys, guys. So I studied English lit at school and they made me read Chaucer, Sylvia Plath and Shakespeare. And even though I loved language and I loved words, I couldn't relate to them at all. I had no idea what they were talking about and it wasn't my world. And so when I came across Najwa and I read her book, they hit me so hard. She is truly, in my opinion, today's um, poet. Like she is bringing back that platform Thank you. That is, oh God, girl. It, like, read her books, guys. It is beautiful. It is so well written. It hit me so hard. I had so many quotes that I didn't actually get to say out loud, but go check out all her stuff because it will be life changing. Trust me. <laughs> if you're not following me, guys, do follow me at Lisa Billu and click that little subscribe <laughs> button down there to subscribe. And until <laughs> next time, go be the hero of your own life. Yes. What up guys, Lisa here. Thanks so much for watching this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed, click that little bell right in front of you. Click, click, click away. We release episodes every Wednesday, so be sure to get notified. Till next time, go be the hero of your own life.